NASA is targeting no earlier than April 8 for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter to make the first attempt at a powered controlled flight of an aircraft on another planet. Ingenuity remains attached to the belly of NASA's Perseverance rover, which touched down on Mars on February 18. On March 21, the rover deployed the guitar case shaped graphite composite debris shield that protected Ingenuity during landing. The rover currently is in transit to the airfield, where Ingenuity will attempt to fly. Before Ingenuity takes its first flight on Mars, it must be squarely in the middle of its airfield, a 10 by 10 meter patch of Martian real estate, chosen for its flatness and lack of obstructions. Once the helicopter and rover teams confirm that, Perseverance is situated exactly where they want it to be, the elaborate process to deploy the helicopter on the surface of Mars begins. The helicopter deployment process will take about six souls, or six Martian days. On the first soul, the team on Earth will release a locking mechanism that helped hold the helicopter firmly against the rover's belly. The following soul, a mechanized arm that holds ingenuity begins rotating the helicopter out of its horizontal position. This is also when the rotorcraft will extend two of its four landing legs. During the third sole of the deployment sequence, a small electric motor will finish rotating Ingenuity until it latches, bringing the helicopter completely vertical. During the fourth sole, the final two landing legs will snap into position. On the fifth sole of deployment, the team will use the final opportunity to utilize Perseverance as a power source and charge Ingenuity's six battery cells. On the sixth and final scheduled sole of this deployment phase, the team will need to confirm that Ingenuity's four legs are firmly on the surface of Juzero Crater, and the rover did indeed drive about five meters away, and that both helicopter and rover are communicating via their onboard radios. Once the team is ready to attempt the first flight, Perseverance will receive and relay to Ingenuity the final flight instructions from mission controllers on the Earth. Ingenuity will run its rotors to 2,537 RPM, and if all final self-checks look good, it will lift off. After climbing at a rate of about 1 meter per second, the helicopter will hover at 3 meters above the surface for up to 30 seconds. Then, the Mars helicopter will descend and touch back down on the Martian surface. Several hours after the first flight has occurred, Perseverance will downlink Ingenuity's first set of engineering data and possibly images and video back to Earth. If that first flight is successful, the project will attempt up to four more over the next month. Ingenuity can fly for up to 90 seconds at a time, with plans to go to altitudes of about 5 meters and travel as much as 50 meters downrange and back. An SUV-sized Earth satellite that will be equipped with the largest reflector antenna ever launched by NASA is taking shape in the cleanroom at the agency's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Called NICER, the joint mission between NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization will spot warning signs of imminent volcanic eruptions, monitor groundwater supplies, track the melt rate of ice sheets, and observe shifts in the distribution of vegetation around the world. Monitoring these kinds of changes in the planet's surface over nearly the entire globe hasn't been done before. The spacecraft will use two kinds of synthetic aperture radar to measure changes in Earth's surface, hence the name NICER, which is short for NASA ISRO SAR. The satellite will use a wire mesh radar reflector antenna nearly 12 meters in diameter at the end of a 9 meter long boom to send and receive radar signals to and from Earth's surface. NICER will detect movements of the planet's surface as small as a centimeter over areas about the size of half a tennis court. The satellite will scan the entire globe every 12 days, imaging the Earth's land, ice sheets, and sea ice on every orbit. Recently members of the NICER mission at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory received the S-band synthetic aperture radar from their partner in India. Together with the L-band synthetic aperture radar provided by JPL, the two radars serve as the beating heart of the mission. The S and L denote the wavelength of their signal, with S at about 10 cm and L around 25 cm. Both radars work by bouncing microwave signals off of the planet's surface and recording how long the signals take to return to the satellite, as well as their strength when they return. In addition to providing the project's L-band radar, NASA also provides the radar reflector antenna, the deployable boom, a high-rate communication subsystem for science data, GPS receivers, a solid-state recorder, and a payload data subsystem. ISRO provides the spacecraft bus, the S-band radar, the launch vehicle, and associated launch services and satellite mission operations. 
The satellite will be launched no earlier than January 2023, atop ISRO's GSLV Mark II rocket from Sathish Dhawan Space Center in Sriharikota. The satellite will operate in a sun-synchronous orbit from an altitude of 747 kilometers. The SpaceX Falcon 9 launched another set of Starlink satellites on March 24, 15 years to the day after the company's first unsuccessful launch. The Falcon 9 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, carrying the 60 Starlink satellites. This launch, by coincidence, took place exactly 15 years after SpaceX conducted the first launch of its Falcon 1 rocket from Kwajalein Atoll Island in the Pacific Ocean. The launch was unsuccessful, as the first stage's single engine failed about half a minute after liftoff. Two subsequent Falcon 1 launches also failed before the fourth Falcon 1 launch carrying a test payload reached orbit in September 2008. The Falcon 1 flew one more mission in 2009 before SpaceX retired the vehicle in favor of the far larger Falcon 9 rocket. The rocket's first stage, on its sixth flight, landed on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean eight and a half minutes after liftoff. The booster, which first launched last June carrying a GPS satellite, also launched Turks at 5A in January 2021, as well as three other Starlink missions. The rocket's upper stage deployed its payload of 60 Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit, 64 minutes after liftoff. This launch was the ninth Falcon 9 mission of 2021, and the fourth this month. Seven of those nine launches, including all four in March, have been dedicated to Starlink, increasing the constellation size to more than 1,300 satellites. SpaceX is inching closer to filling its initial internet constellation, which is planned to be 1,440 strong. Eventually, that constellation could be tens of thousands of satellites strong, as SpaceX has permission to launch as many as 30,000, with an option for even more. In 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration produced a first-ever image of a black hole, which lies at the center of the M87 galaxy. The image showed a bright ring with a dark center, which is the black hole's shadow. Now, a new image showing magnetic fields surrounding the supermassive black hole has been released by scientists working on the Event Horizon Telescope. The magnetic structure was mapped by measuring the polarization of the light emitted by matter in the hot region around the black hole. Light is an oscillating wave with electric and magnetic components. The electric field component of a light wave can oscillate in any direction perpendicular to the direction of travel. If the waves have a preferred direction of oscillation, we say the light is polarized. In space, randomly moving hot gas, also known as plasma, emits unpolarized light. Magnetic fields in space preferentially let the oscillations in one direction pass through, thereby polarizing such unpolarized lights. The intense gravity near a black hole bends its magnetic field and twists the polarization direction of the light from the surrounding plasma. Studying such polarized light images gathered by telescopes on Earth illuminates the structure of the magnetic fields at the edge of the black hole. Scientists working on the Event Horizon Telescope have analyzed the polarization of light from the bright region surrounding the shadow of the M87 black hole. They observed that some matter is being sucked into the black hole, while other matter is being blasted out in jets. In two new papers published on March 24 in the Astrophysical Journal, the scientists suggest that the magnetic field around the black hole may be strong enough to push out the matter in jets that would otherwise fall irretrievably past its event horizon. How these jets are formed is a matter of debate amongst astrophysicists, but understanding the magnetic fields near supermassive black holes could provide important clues. Link to the research papers is provided in the description. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After an aborted static fire test of Starship serial number 11 on March 15, SpaceX successfully completed the first triple-engine static fire test of SN11 on March 22. Ahead of the static fire test on Monday, SpaceX conducted two other tests which were relevant to the flight. The forward and aft flaps of SN11 were tested on Sunday, followed by the reaction control system thruster firings. Both tests were performed without any issues. On Wednesday, two days after the seemingly successful static fire test of serial number 11, SpaceX removed one of SN11's Raptor engines and installed Raptor serial number 46 in its place. It's unclear what the issue is with the Raptor that was removed from serial number 11. 
Two days later, on Friday, SpaceX conducted the second triple-engine static fire test of SN11, verifying the engine health after the engine swap on Wednesday. On the same day, the Starship SN11 was set to perform its high-altitude test flight, and a road closure notice was issued by County Judge Eddie Trevino Jr., mentioning the 10 km flight test of SN11. Moreover, SpaceX officially announced a flight on their website. Hours later, however after a heavy visibility reducing marine layer haze had settled in, the road closure was cancelled, and a testing concluded notice was posted on the Cameron County SpaceX page. Later Elon Musk himself stated that SpaceX is standing down from the SN11 flight to allow more time for additional checks. Shortly after that, the weekend FAA restrictions were withdrawn. On Saturday, SpaceX officially declared that the launch would happen as early as Monday, March 29. The FAA recently released a temporary flight restriction over the airspace above SpaceX's test site in Boca Chica from March 29 to 31. This ensures that the high-altitude test flight of SN11 will most likely take place on one of these days. Although last week's rare double testing event did not materialize, the fact that SpaceX was prepared to support it confirms their confidence in the testing flow and with the Starship campaign. Despite the delay of SN11's maiden flight, construction work at the Starship launch site is progressing. Vertical formwork is going up on the orbital launch tower near the orbital launch mount. Orbital launch tower will be capable of lifting and lowering Starship atop the super heavy booster ahead of orbital flights. The tower includes a crew access arm, which provides a bridge to the spacecraft from the launch tower. Last week, at SpaceX's McGregor test facility, SpaceX conducted two test fires of Starship Raptor engines. The tests were performed on two separate test stands at McGregor, which were recently modified to support testing Starship engines in a more flight-like configuration. Most likely, one or both of those Raptors will soon find themselves on a Starship or Super Heavy prototype in Boca Chica. In a recent tweet, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk mentioned that Raptor vacuum engine development and testing are going well, and SpaceX is working for an extra 20 seconds of specific impulse. In a separate tweet, Mr. Musk mentioned that SpaceX is developing rockets needed to make life multiplanetary and provide full and rapid reusability at a large scale. According to him, even if SpaceX fails in that goal, the rockets will still be the most advanced on Earth. He added that, only rockets that are fully and rapidly reusable will be competitive, and everything else will seem like a cloth biplane in the age of jets. According to him, SpaceX will be landing starships on Mars well before 2030. The really hard threshold is making Mars Base Alpha self-sustaining. Mars Base Alpha is the codename given by Elon Musk to the proposed first human base on Mars. Now, let's take a look at the work progress at the Starship build site. Super Heavy Booster BN1 integration is almost complete inside the high bay. According to Elon Musk, Super Heavy re-entry will be much similar to Falcon 9 booster. It will come more like a javelin and will be caught by the launch tower. Recently SpaceX installed a bridge crane inside the high bay. With the help of a bridge crane, the operator positions the hoist and hook prior to raising or lowering a load. A recent flyover by RGV Aerial Photography spotted a white mystery structure at the build site. This could either be the part of the orbital launch mount or a stand to transport booster BN1 to the launch site. The orbital launch pad ground service equipment tank is now nearly complete, with the forward dome being stacked on the two stacks of four stainless steel rings. It is speculated that several such ground support tanks will be used to hold propellants at the orbital tank farm to support orbital launches. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.